Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest today is one of nine children born and raised in Minnesota. She has worn many hats. She certified fitness instructors, was a financial advisor, ran an assisted living facility, and even had a song on the top 100 country billboard chart. Now she has a critically acclaimed debut novel that captures some of her life's experiences. Free Falling is a poignant and provocative work of senior romance literary fiction. Welcome to Authors Over 50, Emi McGonham. Oh, thank you so much. And I love that you were able to pronounce my name. Emi's a tricky one. It really is. And I can butcher a name. So thank you for being with me, Amy. And our opening question is always, what took you so long to write your first book? I was a singer songwriter in my youth. So I've been writing forever, fiddling around with words, thousands of songs. But it was always a goal of mine to do a novel. And yet it seemed like I Herculean task. And I finally decided I had enough time to tackle that task. And I'd accumulated enough perspective on a story that I wanted to bring forward that I knew now was the time. Well, I agree. And I think that you've had as many varied careers as I did. And (laughs) you must tell us about your time as a singer, because having a top 100 billboard hit is no easy feat. (laughs) It was not an easy feat. But you know what? It's a very similar business as the book business. Um, I did that in the early 80s, a song called Every Breath I Take. I had attracted investors. They loved my sound. I ended up going to Los Angeles to record, found a producer and a promoters and all of that in Los Angeles. And they sent out the music and the DJs liked my sound. So it was one of those lucky crazy, oh my God, a dream coming true moment in my life. Yes. Do you still write songs? I do. You know, it's a funny thing. Many writers journal. I journal in rhyme. I If I've got something really pressing on me, I just start jotting down lines. And because it's been so many years of that format, that actually flows fastest. Well, I love reading books by songwriters and singers because your book passages flow lyrically, you know, like a song. Well, when we're lucky, they do. I think of the paragraph as being like a verse. And you have to have an arc in every verse. And I think every paragraph needs to include the arc as well as the chapter and, of course, the book. Well, how did you choose the romance genre, although it is the very best-selling one in the world? Yep, it is the best-selling one in the world. Some would argue that my book is more a literary work than a standard romance. Um, 
But for me, as a senior myself, I wanted to see a story that reflected more of what I have seen in the world and would be relevant to people of our vintage. And you do know that 34% of the population is over the age of 50. So we deserve an opportunity to see what would love look like with the challenges? Because the truth of this chapter is there will be challenges, whether they're physical, cognitive, emotional, even the arc of our story is very different than it is for a younger person. So I boldly came forward. And women buy more books than anybody in the world. So I think you're in the right niche. Well, I have been surprised when I do book talks. Men come reluctantly. Ah, romance, you know, they're kind of growling. They don't do that. But it's surprising how enthusiastic the men are with the idea that no matter what's happening with our bodies, we're still given the potential to live joy to our last breath. And that is my mission to help us remember that no matter the challenges, as our curves are softening, as our confusions may be increasing, our mobility changing, we still have the seeds of who we are in there, and we can live joy to our last breath. From your lips. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Once you wrote your manuscript, how did you proceed? Did you search for an agent, decide to use a hybrid, a small press, or did you self-publish? Well, of course, when I wrote my first version, first I went and got a coach. <laughs> <laughs> and made sure I knew what I was doing. Having been a songwriter, I needed to get some, no, no, you don't go ahead and use dialogue through the whole thing. You know, it started out different that way. Then I sent out letters to agents and nobody wanted to talk about senior romance. And then I went and I looked for publishers. I did get an agent, by the way, who wanted to work with me, but he said it would take two to three years. And then, of course, you know, I'm not a young woman. So I started researching other options and I found investors, much like decades ago, who formed Autumn Stories Publishing. And I was able to bring that book forward, Free Falling, a novel of senior romance, came out through Autumn Stories Publishing. And I am among the investors, and I intend to help bring other stories forward that speak to the experience in the autumn of our lives. I love that. I think you have found a great place to be. <laughs> Well, I like it. And, you know, I've sold more than a thousand books. So we're starting to make a little dent in the market. I'll do what I can. Yes. And they say that uh, single standalone books don't earn us as much money as if you write a series. So do you have other books in you to write? I'm working on, I've been saying reconfigured dreams is about a third of the way, maybe half the way through. And I thought that was going to be my next book. And, and yet it still may be. But concurrently, I started to write the Brandon story, one of the male characters in the book. People have been asking me about Brandon. And so I have started working on that. I've got a, probably 120 pages on Brandon's story, trying to unravel who he really is, how he became who he is, what happened in the interims. I don't want to ruin the story of free falling, but it does open up questions for readers and they have strong opinions about Brandon. 
They really do. We we want our stories and we want them quickly. You know, these readers can devour your books and they want the next one. So it's it's difficult to keep them satisfied. I know they're chomping at the bit for Brandon's story. And now we're hearing about AI. And I thought, oh, oh, no. <laughs> that, is, you know, even if I could, part of the joy is finding my words to tell my stories and, you know, take the life that I have absorbed and reconfigure it and spin it and end out with a perspective that shares the intentions that I hope to share with the world before I leave. Well, I think AI is great for prompts and for um, writing speeches and things like that, but it hasn't yet captured emotions. And I think that's what humans bring to our stories. Oh, if we don't, we've missed the mark. And so you're right. They use it for marketing and things like that. I I don't even have the program, so I haven't experimented with it. But I do feel, for me, it's, it's a little selfish. I just want to do my own book. <laughs> As well, you should. Yeah. Did writing your first book change your process of writing for the ones that are coming next? Well, I'd like to return to the incredible disciplines that I brought to free falling. One of the problems I'm having with that is as I'm focusing on the marketing of free falling, I am struggling with having my writer's hours, which are midnight to 4 a.m. <laughs> And you're a real know, night owl. I'm truly a night owl. Well, I was a professional singer for crying out loud. That's when we would work. And so um, I, I still struggle to fall asleep before three. But if I have a seven o'clock wake up call, because I've got to wake up before I actually do a conversation, a little coffee, whatever. Um, it's real hard to stay up that late. And so now I am struggling to hold the discipline because in two years, somewhere between five and 10 nights, I did not write. But otherwise, I maintained that discipline. I'd sit down here and turn on the light and the computer and I just start looking at the pages. If I was stuck, I'd go in and do research. What were the clothing items that were most contemporary for that time? What was considered the best designer? What perfumes? You know, silly little details that I think ultimately add up to making a difference. But the exciting part is when I'm rolling, when I get the story really rolling and I can't stop and I look up and it's light out. <laughs> Goodness, that is a, a different lifestyle right there. But I, I think making our habits, um, making sure that we write every day when we're in a project is so important to keep us in the story. It is. And I'm hoping to get my next book out by March. So somewhere I have to capture the hardcore disciplines because I've done book tours and I've gone to different time zones and, you know, oh, my Lord. And if you're staying with people, you really, <laughs> you can't write from it. Before. They'll think they have a vampire in their midst. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's right. And some of them think it might be true. <laughs> but yeah, I uh, I see this happening within the month. In the meantime, I wrote free falling on the North Shore of Minnesota. Much of it. I go there for my real deep um writing sessions and when i was there 
I would go hiking because you might have noticed I'm also a photographer. So when I was out hiking, I was taking pictures and I'd have thoughts, you know, little pearls of wisdom kind of popping in. And so I decided that I'm going to release a photography book because on Facebook under Amy Spirit, I have 16,000 followers, a little more than that. And under Amy McConnell, another 5,000. And I figured these people are used to seeing the photography. So why don't I give them some of the pictures that I took and, you know, little pearls of wisdom. And that one's called Free Falling Moments. And I expect that book, which isn't a big book, but I expect that one to be out by November 1st. Well, what was your inspiration for Free Falling? Well, as you know, I worked in an assisted living facility. And the first line of the book is she leads with her breasts as she enters the lobby. And that was a resident who lived <laughs> at the assisted living that I was running. And as I watched, she got involved in a love story at 93 years old. This woman who was the one who carried joy to her last breath, she was still a sexy lady. In fact, the best flirt I ever saw. I learned a lot from watching that lady. <laughs> And so she was the primary inspiration. And then some of the internal stories within the book are people who have told me stories, have shared their life events. And I just took it and I kind of spun it around until I had a story that I felt had the meaning that I wanted to share. Have you had the same challenges that a lot of writers have. We don't like to promote ourselves. Have you found any publicity that's worked for you in post-production uh, of this book? I think the best thing is meeting people personally, to be honest. I've got on emyspirit.com, I've posted some of the podcasts and some of the events that I've been at, I've got one coming up in a couple of weeks. But when people meet me in person, I think they pick up that energy in a different way. And they understand that I am speaking to them. It's not this vague other people thing. It's you are invited to live joy to your last breath. So if only I could speak every day to real people, I think more books would sell. And I learned during the pandemic about Zoom. I had no idea what that even meant before the pandemic. But now we can Zoom into book clubs all across the world. I have not done that. It's probably a good idea especially if people have already read the book because free falling has lots of points for conversation. Yes. And the topics also can be your platforms, you know, to speak to um, newspapers and, you know, there are always months and dates that, that celebrate something or other. And you can always jump in on that with the topics that you have. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about the passage you've brought to share today and then read from it so we can hear your tone and voice in the book. Well, all right, I will do that. I am, um, I'll show you the cover. Free Falling is a novel of senior romance, but it also includes a real important story of dementia. Charlotte, the lead character in the first chapter has Louis body dementia. Louis body is an interesting kind of dementia that includes hallucinations, but also intermittent episodes of this kind of dementia. It isn't like Alzheimer's is a decline that continues on a straight trajectory, pretty much so. In Louis body, you can be completely confused thinking somebody's fine, 
And then all of a sudden, there's a drop in cognitive situation. So I'm going to take you into the story in chapter one. Charlotte, our lead character at this point, is 75. We, in the next chapter, will meet her at age 60 before her cognitive challenges became evident. But here we will meet her as she is having some issues. 2019. Charlotte leads with her breasts as she enters the lobby. Still striking at 75 years old, no one can convince her she is incompetent and attractive. Good morning, Miss Charlotte. Looking lovely in that blue, Carla says with the concierge foam cradled on her shoulder. A hint of jasmine perfumes the air as Charlotte approaches. Peacock blue, Charlotte pulls a dried flower from the bouquet on the welcome desk. Brandon's favorite color on me. Makes sense. Brandon, your assistant? No, no, she says, her inward smile as she rearranges the newspapers on the marble coffee table. That's Christopher. Color rising in her cheek, she gives Carla a slow, knowing wink. Brandon's my special man. Carla's eyes dart to the housekeeper roaming the lobby. She lifts her eyebrow and shares an old boy glance. Charlotte's gaze flows to the housekeeper, too. Oh, Kelly, she coos. I'm happy to see you. How are you doing today? Just fine, Miss Charlotte, the petite woman says, tucking her chin in deference, but turning slightly away, aware she's getting pulled into a favor. But Charlotte presses, presses on. Today is too important. Iron fist, velvet glove. I was wondering if you or someone on your team could dust the baseboards and make sure this area is vacuumed before noon. Could you get this done by then? Charlotte dramatically sweeps her hand over the area. This oriental rug is beautiful, but it catches lint so easily. Sure, she says with her no thank you lips. She holds up her clipboard with its pencil dangling on a kitchen string. But the schedule is second floor commons today. That's good too, Charlotte lifts her chin ever so slightly, nodding imperceptibly to elicit agreement. It's more likely to be seen by our guests. A good first impression is essential. Kelly looks at Carla. Here we go again. Charlotte's accustomed to quiet resistance. A little sugar goes a long way. I've noticed you've done a great job making the place look beautiful for our visitors. I'm not complaining, eyes direct as her jaw tips. It's just a few details. I'm gonna step back here because not too long after this, we'll see Charlotte suddenly dip into a trance as she feels her lover is now in the lobby. The person she's waiting for, the staff is aware that she's in confusion. And yet, is she? <laughs> That's great. I could just see her. You just described her so vividly. Her <laughs> mannerisms, everything. I could just see her. Well, she, you will learn in second chapter, ran a five-star hotel. So that's why she's noticing all those details mm -hmm. and directing people to take care of them. The staff at the assisted living, however, isn't buying into the whole program. <laughs> <laughs> Much to her chagrin. <laughs> oh, she's not quite content with that. <laughs> Amy, what does writing success look like to you personally? Why, that's a good idea. Who wouldn't want to be in the New York Times? Who wouldn't want to get a Nobel Prize? 
of course, we all have wild dreams of getting on Good Morning America, although I do have to lose some weight before I go there. But the truth is, I want to make a difference in the world. I'm at the point where my legacy matters, and I would like it to be that we see ourselves as good, that we see ourselves as forgivable. I create complicated characters. I create stories where we're digging for the reasons people are who they are. And I find for myself, when somebody uncovers the layers and still lets the person be good, that matters. So that's my intention. I'd like to sell a lot of books because I'd like a lot of people to feel that in their lives, to feel seen. That's so important these days for young people and older people. And you use the word that I use so often is our legacy. These books are going to live long after us. And I was so thrilled when one of my granddaughters chose one of my books to read as a book report in school. And she said, you know, Juju, not everybody's grandmother writes books. So that just thrilled me. And so I, I think that we do present a legacy to our children and grandchildren and to the wide world. We sure do. My grandson just turned 16 and he listened to the Audible. I did the Audible and you'll see more about that on emyspirit.com too. But Dylan listened to the Audible version of my book. And, you know, there are some adult passages in the book. And he sent me a text when he was done. He said, Grandma, this is so good. I can't wait to read your next book. That was worth it to me. I think so. <laughs> I, I think that's your legacy right there. And I love that you narrated your own book. Uh, that's just fabulous. I listen to audio books all the time, so I'll oh, have to listen to yours. I would love that. It was fun to do. I had considered hiring somebody. And I've got a degree in theater. I'm a singer-songwriter. I've been a performer. I thought, oh, for crying out loud, I should be able to do this. Yes, you well, should. I hired a, a guy who had worked on my recordings before, and we did it together. And it was great. I intend to do the next book, too. Although you can't do it for a photo book. <laughs> well, people love to hear the the voice of the author, especially in an audio book. They really love that. So I think that was a wise move on your part. Well, thank you. I appreciate your enthusiasm for the idea. I have read that if you don't do a good job, people are very irritated. So I'm hoping it's a good job. I've been a little disappointed because I put it on the market at $14.99 and they're selling it at almost $22. So it's a discouraging price point for a number of people. Yes. And a lot of times we have to um, go to some of the discount places to have the volume like Chirp, you know, will sell your your audio book for $1.99 or $2.99 or $3.99. And you hope for, you know, many more sales with that. That would be good. I also understand Libro. Are you familiar with that? It, the independent bookstores benefit from that. Yes. So and the libraries buy those as well on Libby for, they have the service Libby. I think I need to put it up in another format somehow. Uh, there's just, no. it's just so <laughs> many hours in the day. I know. And the learning curves. Yes. There are a lot I of learning grateful. curves. I apparently have a pretty good brain, <laughs> but there are points where I go, but I don't want to. I, I still have tantrums. Well, that's when you hire a virtual assistant. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Take this and put this up. Yes, yeah. Anything you don't want to do. Yes. 
Well, yes. we've had a great visit today. And I'll, as always, our last interview question is, our writers over 50 are quite unique. Do you have advice for writers 50 and above? Just do it. Stay with it. Don't let your fears get in the way. And I'm a big fan of a good editor because if you haven't written before, editors have a sense of the arc of a book in a different way than we do. So go ahead, let people help you. It doesn't mean you're not doing a good job. It means a good job is trusting help. That's great advice today, and we just appreciate your being here with us and and using your beautiful lyrical voice to narrate and to write these books, and we look forward to reading those and listening to them. So thank you for, for being here today so that we can now count you among our authors over 50. Yay! I appreciate it. I appreciate it very much, Julia. Thank you for joining us today. Please look for Authors Over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. Please subscribe and share with a friend. And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like daily newspaper.com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third.